to, uh, to uh, think about today, get you caught up on some things. Uh, first one is uh, the women, the United Women in Faith, uh, need to meet just briefly, immediately after the worship service today. Judy says she has something she needs to talk to you about. <clears throat> Second thing is someone just pointed out that in our bulletin, it's talking about our Lenten and Rural services that start next Sunday. And it says they're at 7 o'clock. They will be at 6 o'clock. So please mark your calendars, mark your bulletin that it's 6 o'clock, not 7 o'clock for the Lenten Renewal Services. And does anyone else have anything of importance? Yes, Kathy? So you need food for the 12th, yes. but the snacks after the re yes. renewal service. Thank you. If there's a group or a Sunday school class or somebody that wants to do that, that'd be great. Any other announcements for the good of the congregation? Well, if not, will you pray with me? Oh, Lord, take our hearts, our minds, and our wheels down that rewarding path of worship so that we may learn more of your ways, learn more of your love, and more of our need to respond to the truth that you will reveal to us today. Bless all who are worshiping with us today as we open ourselves to what we see and what we hear in your house. Amen. Will you stand for the interests of the light? Yeah, Mary. Woo! Did you have a 
may be seated. If you'll take a look at your uh, prayer list, print it in the bulletin. And I forgot to get my own. Helps if I'm looking at the same thing you are. I have a couple of additions here. Um, Michael Sharp, Joey Teague says he's having knee surgery Thursday. Ask for our prayers. Uh, hopefully, I'll get that knee straightened out. He's been having, you've been giving him problems for about a month now. Hopefully, I'll get that taken care of. Joey, Joey Teague, and I think Teresa, you said you were having it's Thursday too. So, <laughs> yours is knee replacement, right? I think it's stuff out of mine. I don't think she wants more stuff out of mine. <laughs> <laughs> she don't want that out of yours. Uh, also, I have a, uh, a note here that uh, 
uh, Gail Sprouse, that's Judy uh, Jones' sister, passed away. Her funeral will be at Holy Trinity on Thursday, the 23rd, at 11 o'clock. Where is Holy Trinity? Okay. I was. I know I'm supposed to know where it's at, but it just wasn't coming to me, so I was. Okay. Also, uh, Judy had a very dear friend. Judy Jones had a very dear friend, Pat Hicks, who passed away last week. So you would please keep uh, both Pat's and Gail's families in your prayers. And keep Judy in your prayers, too. She's, uh, she's been through a lot lately with all this. Also, I have a uh, chastity. Uh, Stanley gave me a note that uh, Hans Jung, one of her co-workers' fathers, uh, is um, fighting some kind of lung, lung infection. He's been unable to, they've been unable to make a definite diagnosis as to what kind of infection it is. It's some kind of infection, but the, all the biopsies have been inconclusive. So they're asking us to pray for healing and for the medical team to find out what it takes to treat it. You know, I hear that so much lately that they find, they know there's something, but they don't know what it is, and so they don't know how to treat it. So please pray for the medical team and for uh, Mr. Jones. Wesley having oral surgery and in a lot of pain right now. So. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I be in prayer for my sister Gail Luper. Her uh, husband Nancy Luper passed away Thursday uh, after fighting uh, Parkinson's disease for 15 years. Uh, praise God, he's gone home uh, and he's no longer in pain. Uh, but uh, just be in prayer for Gail and the family uh, as they uh, deal with his death. Feel hardest. Cindy Storms. Cindy Storms. <laughs> Folks, let's go to the Lord in prayer.
great God of glory and mercy. Before his death, your son went up onto a mountain and you revealed his life and glory. There the prophets witnessed to him and he proclaimed him as your son. But then he came to die a death of shame among us. Help us to face evil with courage, knowing that all things, even death, are subject to your transforming power. Holy God of Israel, as you made Moses' face glow on the mountain, when you gave your people your law, so order our steps by your word. As we praise you in this time and in this place, we offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and tell of your glory. Holy God, who transformed Jesus upon the mountain, identifying him as your beloved child, transform us, that is, the body of Christ, in this time, in this place, so that we may be a revelation of your grace this particular day. Transfigure your church to be about your work. Transfigure our society according to your justice. Transfigure our budgets according to the needs of the poor. Transfigure our lives toward your service. Well, God, just as we look into a mirror to see any dirty spots on our face, let us look to you in order to understand the things that we are doing that are wrong. We are like reeds shaking in the wind. We are inexpressibly weak. Leave us not to ourselves, Lord, but dwell in our hearts and guide our thoughts and our actions. Be with all those who are on our prayer list and those missing in our hearts and our minds. Give them the healing and the strength they need. All these things we ask in the name of your beloved transfigured son who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And this time we will continue our worship service by the receiving of God's tithes and our offerings. You may bring them to the either to this plate in the back or to the front while resurrection sings. As we get ready to sing this song, it's the name of it is Jesus is coming. Soon. He is coming soon. Uh, just think that, reflect on the words, what they mean. Uh, because it is, you know, uh, we thank him for all he does. For all those who have gone home to him, they're there. Let's just know that we too will someday be seeing Jesus. And he is coming soon. Now, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Not we. Yes. In motion now.
Precious Lord, your word assures us of your care for us, even when things are bad, that we should make first things first, even in the hard times. As we seek your kingdom as our priority and receive your countless blessings, even of material things, may we always remember that you are faithful and that we are fortunate stewards. And that it is all, always more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Sunday of Transfiguration. We pray that your light would pour over these pages and illustrate those old, old words. That they would dance with newness in our hearts and our minds. And that we would be radiating and reflecting your word in our lives and in our service to one another. Amen. Amen. And let me get the kids up here. Oh, <laughs>
got eight kids and wearing short, short pants and short sleeves in this kind of weather. But that's okay. You know, almost every day, if you driving around, you'll see bumper stickers on cars. Does your car, does y'all's car have bumper stickers on them? What do they say? Western Carolina model. 106.9, a lot. 106.9, a lot, yeah. I don't think we have any on our car. But then a lot of people wear, have bumper stickers on their cars, uh, supporting their favorite school or their favorite team. Uh, things about their their child is an honor student somewhere or something like that. And there's even Christian bumper stickers. I think one of the more common ones is that one that says, honk if you love Jesus. Of course, then people put that on the car and start get upset when people blow the horn behind them. That's always funny. And I saw another one not so long ago that said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Now that sounds like a pretty good bumper sticker, right? But when I thought about it, I think it said too much. Because what it should have said is, God said it, that settles it. It doesn't matter whether I believe it or not. If God said it, it's truth. Well, when Jesus was walking on the earth, there were a lot of different ideas about who Jesus was. There were some people who thought he was just a good teacher. There were other people that thought he might have been Elijah or one of the prophets returned. And some people even somehow got the idea that he might really be John the Baptist. And even his own disciples didn't totally understand who he was. You can tell that by some of the comments they made all along. But one day Jesus took three of his closest disciples with him up on the mountain to pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him. And when they went up on the mountain, something amazing happened. Jesus' appearance changed. His face shined like the sun and his clothes were white as snow. And then Moses and Elijah appeared. And start talking to Jesus. Well, the disciples couldn't believe their eyes. But after that, they couldn't believe their ears because suddenly there was this voice. The voice of God that said, this is my son. I love him and I am pleased with him. Listen to what he has to say. Well, from that moment on, Peter, James, and John had no question, no doubt at all who Jesus was. You see, they were witnesses for the majesty. And Peter writes later on that we ourselves heard the voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the mountain. Now the problem is, is today there are still a lot of people who don't know who Jesus is. They might think they do, but they don't. If you don't know him, you don't know who he is. But we know he's the son of God. And how do we know that? Because God said so. And that settles it. Whether anybody believes it or not. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus your son. We know that he is your son just because you said so. That settles it. What's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
scripture today comes from the books of Exodus, Matthew, and 2 Peter, from Exodus chapter 24, verses 12 through 18. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, Wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up into the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And from Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became bright as light. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will set up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my, my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they raised their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about this vision until the after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. And from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we were made known to you, the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning the star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The Word of God for the people of God. You know, sometimes those folks that prescribe the scriptures for a particular Sunday for the lectionary. Sometimes they do a good job of getting scriptures that kind of match up with each other. And sometimes you have to wonder what they were thinking. But today they did a great job. These three scriptures really link well. So I need to ask you, if you had had the opportunity to go with Moses up onto that mountain into the cloud of God's glory, would you have gone? I thought about that. I'm not sure. I can't really make up my mind. On the one hand, that'd be an opportunity that you just couldn't miss, right? But on the other hand, I would probably be scared stiff. I might not be able to move. I mean, there's a lot of things happening in the book of Exodus about that time. There was the giving of the law. There was the instructions for making the tabernacle and for Israel's worship. And at the center of all that was a good old-fashioned appearance of God. 
God initiates the action, and it takes place on a mountain, a holy mountain. And the people, even the elders of the tribes, had to stay back. The cloud covered the mountain. And after six days of waiting, on the seventh day, God speaks. And the glory of God appears as a devouring fire in the sight of all the people. Now here, the scripture writers seem to struggle to describe the holiness of God. I mean, God's not like you and I, right? And this scripture reminds us of that. You see, the presence of God calls for awe and reverence and fear. I'm intrigued by the possibility of experiencing the indescribable glory of God firsthand. But if I were given the chance to go with Moses up on that mountain, I think I might would have been more comfortable staying back with the rest of the folks. But you know that passage from Exodus has a lot in common with today's gospel lesson about the transfiguration of Jesus. These two scriptures, in both of them, people struggle to describe God's holiness. In both of them, we have a mountain, we have a cloud, we have chosen witnesses, and we have the glory of God. Now, if these passages seem strange to you, then you're not alone. How many of you have been on a mountain and been in, and felt God's glory there in the mountains and, and heard God's voice and all that? I've felt God's presence up in the mountains before, but not like this. You see, modern day Christians tend to look at things, these kind of scriptures as fossils. These attempts to describe God in these texts are a bit crude. Perhaps modern day people are a touch more developed and they, their modern theologians would write different things. But like fossils, these scriptures show things how things used to be. But this is how people imagine God before they learn better, right? No. Not quite. They're describing God the best they could because that's the way God is. He hasn't changed. You see, Fossils are no longer alive. But scripture is alive and well. If we'll pay attention to it. Now, most contemporary theologians speak in abstracts and ethical things. But you don't see a whole lot of fire and clouds in their theology. Our attempts to describe God are good and helpful. But we should be, we should not despise what the folks of many years ago used to describe God. Even though it's different from ours. Especially when it's found in the scriptures. What we lose when we give up the cloud of fire, fire is those vivid images of God and the sense of awe and reverence and powerful presence that these stories express to us. We need to be reminded that God is transcendent. We need to feel the power and the wonder again. We need to feel the Holy Spirit with us.
both that story of the transfiguration of Jesus and the story of Moses on the mountain speak of more than just God's glory. They teach us that God reaches out to us. I mean, yeah, God is holy and majestic and far above us. And us being finite creatures, we can never truly understand or truly experience God. Nevertheless, God desires to reach out to us. So God accommodates our weaknesses. God comes to us in ways that we can experience, in ways that we can comprehend. Now, Moses was the mediator between God and Israel. I mean, Israel needed instructions for how to live, how to worship. If they were going to be God's people, that is, if they were going to have a relationship with God, they needed to know how to do that. And that was Moses' mission on the mountain. And the Gospels tell us that Jesus is greater than Moses. But he's about the same business. He's about showing us God. That's how we know God. We know God through Jesus. And the better we comprehend the holiness of God, the more we value what Jesus did for us. Now the Christian life balances or tries to balance the mystery of God with the imminent relationship of God. Now we might use different words from the ancient writers, but we share with them a common experience. The one true God, sovereign and holy, has reached out to us. And we're overwhelmed and maybe just a little bit frightened when we experience it. But we go to the mountain because God has called us there. Now these three disciples went up on the mountain because Jesus called them there. The disciples in the gospel reading today lived with an understanding of God that was peculiar to them. They understood Jesus in a very peculiar, peculiar way too. They were, Jesus, they were Jesus' three closest friends. And thanks to Peter's resourcefulness and confession, We understand that. And because of that confession, he was named the rock on which the church would be built. But still, our understanding of God is veiled in darkness. We have not literally seen the great light like these disciples did. So today, we celebrate the mystery of one of the more profound moments in history. The transfiguration. As Peter said in his letter, it is not fiction nor clearly articulated fairy tales. It's more akin to the transformation of a caterpillar into a butterfly. You know, a caterpillar, caterpillar crawls along the ground and up in the trees and eating and changing and molting until at the right moment it decides to encase itself in a cocoon. And eventually that cocoon opens up and a magnificently colored butterfly, a monarch or a red, purple, herring or whatever they call them, whatever they're destined to be, comes out of that cocoon. Who can explain that? It's a transformation, a transfiguration. Caterpillars become metamorphosized, which literally is literally, 
literally the word that was used in the scriptures for the transfiguration. That's the word that Peter used. Not Peter, but that Matthew used in describing Jesus in the transfiguration. He was completely changed. Not only were his garments white as light, but his face shone like the sun. And for those disciples, Jesus was changed forever. This time they got to witness what happened to Jesus all those times he'd gone up on the mountain by himself to pray. And that's a really common theme in the book of Matthew. Jesus going up on the mountain to pray. And that's symbolic of being between heaven and earth. And every time he did that, something changed. And according to Matthew, the last time he did that, before they went up on the mountain, he missed the boat. And so he had to catch up and walk to them. So he walked on the water. That's the kind of change I like. See, when Jesus went up on the mountain, either alone or with his three companions, he experienced, his experience with God helped him to let go of things. Things that may be constraining him. Each time he seemed to be a little more divine. He had more fire to cast out upon the earth. His baptism as the Son of God was affirmed. His letting go changed everything for all of those around him. I mean, first these disciples were changed from fishermen to fishers of men. The, the lame walked, the blind saw, the deaf heard, the dead lived again. And the world's outlook on life was reversed. God's salvation was at work in the world. And the kingdom of heaven had come near. As time goes by, the presence of God becomes nearer and nearer to us too. But as Peter said in his letter, that scoffers would come. And indeed, they are here today. There are passionate skeptics. And their skepticism fuels an uncertainty about our future relationship with the Almighty. I mean, for sure, the appearance of God would definitely be a turning point in most of our lives. You know, one of the problems today is we live in a digital age. Probably for the first time in history, our children know more about communication and technology than us older adults. I mean, just the sheer numbers and digital ma mastery has changed every company in the world and every economy. Time is collapsing because of the electronic interaction that causes unprecedented change at ever increasing speed. Even our materialism is changing because that gap between desire and purchase has narrowed. Because of the internet, almost anything is available to almost anybody, anywhere, anytime. But what did the Apostle Paul say about that? He said, do not be conformed to this age. 
but rather be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. When Jesus makes his presence felt, we discover that our lives have been cleansed. All those old visions in our head are gone and they are replaced by a new way of viewing ourselves and the world. It's no wonder that Jesus reminds us that we too are the light of the world. That's because we too are transformed by his living presence. His fire takes us and it changes us like that caterpillar into a butterfly. <coughs> Can you explain it? It's as complex and astonishing as the stars that cover the night sky. All I know is that because of one brief shining moment in each of our lives, we ourselves are transformed. We are free to take our lives into more constructive ways of living. For this day of transfiguration is a new and fresh day. Today we have, we have today we are new people because of the change evoked by Jesus Christ. Today, today we can meet life in new ways. Because the one and only true God, sovereign and holy, has reached out to us through Jesus Christ. We're overwhelmed and maybe just a little bit frightened. But we go to that mountain because God has called us there. And then we go forth because he has sent us to all the people of the world. Let us pray. Holy God, upon that mountain you reveal our Messiah, who by his death and resurrection would fulfill both the law and the prophets. By his transfiguration, enlighten our path that we may dare to suffer with him in the service of humanity and so share in the everlasting glory of him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God without end. Amen. In response to the word, join me as we Confess what we believe using the Nicene Creed, some number 880 in your hand, or on the screen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all the sin and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God.
now if you turn your hand to number 405 seek ye first is our closing hymn Go now and speak of what you have seen of God's glory. Do not cling to the holy moments when heaven overshadows you. But as the Lord lives, listen to Christ and follow him from the place of revelation to the place of mission. And may God shine the light of glory into your heart. May Christ be with you and never leave you. And may the Holy Spirit renew the image of God within you. We go in peace and love to serve our Lord in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.